What phenomenon links volcanoes on the moons of Jupiter with the rings of Saturn, with spaghettification in the heart of black holes, and then with a stricken cargo freighter in the heart of the Suez Canal? The production of clickbait YouTube intros, yes, but also something deeper. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? It turns out that to finally get the giant container ship blocking the Suez Canal, the ever given, unstuck, engineers literally needed the heavens to align, specifically the sun, earth, and moon. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? For nearly a week, the ever given ship debacle took the internet by storm, giving even Boaty McBoatface and Titanic 2, yes, it exists, and spoilers, it sinks again. My disappointment is immeasurable. A run for their money. A 1,300 foot long, 400 meter long container ship had gotten wedged into a key trading passageway, the Suez Canal, and was blocking more real progress than Donald Trump's Twitter account and the books of Robin DiAngelo combined. I've been experimenting with these mixed political punchlines. You can collapse the superposition of punchlines based on your own politics, so you can choose your own comedic adventure. Or maybe everyone can be angry with me at the same time. We'll see how that one goes. I have to say why people hate you and... Now happily with the Ever Given, a digger and tugboats dwarfed by the massive vessel have managed to scratch away at the Suez Canal sides and get the Ever Given back underway. However, although we've all been rooting for the diminutive digger that became an international meme sensation, and its associated David versus Goliath story, that focus doesn't quite tell the whole story of the refloating. Because according to Space.com, in this instance, the moon was not just there for decoration. Decoration, man. It's just yeah. for decoration. That's, that's it. it and that's all, man. We do it for decoration. you have it on your car? Yeah, I got it on my car. It actually turns out that when diggers and tugboats weren't getting the refloating job done, salvage experts looked to the heavens and a heavenly collaboration with the supermoon's gravitational pull to help free the stranded vessel. The salvage team actually used last week's supermoon when beginning Sunday water levels were set to rise a foot and a half at high tide higher than the normal high tide to make it easier to pull the 1,300 foot vessel out from the side of the canal without unloading many of the 18,000 or so containers it was carrying. Now, a foot and a half of a higher tide might not seem like much, but in this case, it might have been decisive. You know, I guess one person can make a difference. Enough said. But how could the moon possibly help us to refloat a ship? Well, to understand that, we need to understand what causes the tides, the regular rise and fall of sea levels, here on the Earth. Here comes the science bit. Concentrate. Now, a basic law of physics is that the gravitational force between two massive objects, such as the Earth and the Moon, or the Earth and Kanye West ego, I I'm really happy for you. I'm let you finish. Can be determined using the following equation: F equals G M M over R squared. We find the gravitational force by multiplying the gravitational constant or big G, a fundamental constant of nature, by the masses of the two bodies involved, and then dividing by the square of the distance between them. The force is stronger if the bodies are more massive. So, for example, the sun exerts a stronger gravitational pull than the Earth, and weaker if the objects taking part are further apart. So, for example, Pluto feels a weaker gravitational pull from the sun than the Earth does. Your powers are weak, old man. And as the moon orbits the Earth, it pulls on the Earth's crust and waters, pulling them towards it. 
However, because one side of the Earth is closer to the moon than other parts of the Earth, the gravitational pull on different parts of the Earth have different strengths. This difference or differential in forces is felt as a stretch on the Earth. Imagine someone pulling on one of your arms with a particular force, while someone else pulled on your other arm with only half the force in the same direction. The arm being pulled slightly less strongly would be left behind, and what you would feel would be yourself being stretched by this difference in forces. After applying some simple physics and maths, which I'll link in the description, we can see that the moon exhibits a differential force on the Earth, which depends on the mass of the Earth and moon, and the cube of the distance between them. This force is known as the tidal force, because it leads to tides here on the Earth. It stretches the Earth along the axis with the moon, and squashes it along the perpendicular axis, essentially squashing the Earth into a more oval shape. Indeed, any object of finite size experiences such stretching tidal forces in the gravitational field of another object. Forces that act to stretch it and attempt to rip it apart. I will end you. Now, in the specific case of the moon's gravity, the Earth's sturdy rock structure can resist this stretching. Although the Earth's surface does rise about 30 centimetres at high tide, we just don't see it. But the water of the Earth's seas and oceans yields to this force, creating two watery bulges and two watery dips, the two high tide and low tide points. As the Earth rotates over the course of a day, your region of the Earth passes through both of these bulges. When you're in one of the bulges, you experience a high tide. And when you're not in one of the bulges, you experience a low tide. This cycle of two high tides and two low tides per day occurs on most of the coastlines of the world. And these differential tidal forces not only account for the watery tides here on Earth, but also a hell of a lot of other space-bound phenomena. For example, they account for the Roche limit in astronomy, where moons cannot approach a planet too closely without being ripped apart into rings. So this differential tidal force accounts for Saturn's rings. It also accounts for the tidal flexing and heating of Jupiter's moon Io, which even leads to volcanism on Io, a place where it otherwise shouldn't exist. And these tidal forces even account for the hypothesized stretching out or spaghettification of any object that might cross the event horizon of a black hole. I bet you'll never look at tides the same way again. I bet you'll never look at birds the same way again. So it makes sense that a high tide could help us to, for example, refloat a ship. And the moon influences the tide, so the moon could help us refloat the Ever Given. But how does having a full moon help us? Isn't a full moon just when more light from the sun bounces back off the moon, back to us here on Earth? I mean, how could that possibly help us refloat a ship? Werewolves? Good guess, but wrong. <laughs> well, it actually turns out that tides are higher whenever there is a full or new moon, because these phases of the moon occur when the moon is in direct alignment with the sun and earth, with either the earth or moon in the middle of the three. And although the sun is much further away from the earth, it's much more massive than the moon, and it can therefore create a tidal force on the earth, which is approximately a half of that which the moon is capable of generating. So during a new or a full moon, with the sun, earth and moon aligned along one axis, there's an even greater tidal force applied to the earth. And as a result, high tides are higher and low tides are lower. They're known as spring and neap tides and occur twice a month as the moon orbits the earth. So the salvagers took account and took advantage of this 
alignment. They took advantage of the bi-monthly higher spring tide. <sighs> Clever girl. But that's not all, because there's more coincidences and more cool space physics. Because for the salvagers, the full moon spring tide effect was also amplified by the first supermoon of the year. The occurrence where the full moon coincides with the moon's closest point to the Earth, or perigee, in its elliptical orbit. Now, supermoons, during which the moon can look 14% bigger than when the moon is further away from the Earth, occur several times a year, with the one during the past week being known as the worm moon for the earthworms that begin to appear in the soil in the northern hemisphere at this time of the year. And because the moon is closer to the Earth during a supermoon, the tidal forces that the moon applies to the Earth are maximised and we therefore get an increase in the average range of tides and the height of high tides. And again, a higher high tide makes it easier to refloat a ship, I don't know, say, the Ever Given. Now, typically, a new or full moon coincides closely in time with the perigee of the moon only between about six to eight times per year. Occurrences known as the perigean spring tides. So the salvages in this case were very lucky to hit one of these celestial occurrences. So it's clear that in this case, the salvages took advantage of the cosmic dance to help free the ever given. We may never know whether this cosmic collaboration between tugboat and celestial body was decisive. My work is done here. What do you mean your work is done? You don't do anything. <laughs> Didn't I? But what we do know is that according to salvage experts, it certainly helped to free the ship more easily and more quickly. And when you've got literally billions of dollars of cargo trapped in a passageway and many millions of dollars more being lost by delays, time is not really a luxury you have. And you'll take any collaborator be they of this earth or not.